This is brand new technology and it's going to change the way that mankind travels. It's one of the largest vacuum valves that has ever been built. Yes, the Hyperloop is back in the news. When activated, the valves will close and isolate a section of the tube infrastructure for repressurization. Uh, that's just a valve, a very big gate valve. Once returned to atmospheric conditions, the isolated tube infrastructure can be accessed for overnight maintenance and redundant safety procedures. And believe me, that raises many more questions than it answers. Like, why isn't this actually installed on anything? Like the Hyperloop with pods traveling through it at 700 miles per hour. Why have you just got a valve sat in the middle of a floor somewhere? And uh, how exactly are you going to close that valve when the rails that the Hyperloop runs on go through the middle of that valve. You know, minor little fiddly factual things like that. This is science and innovation at work. Thinking and dreaming about what that future looks like. Vacuum tubes with capsules in it moving passengers at up to 700 miles per hour. Uh, yeah, I'll tell you what it looks like after about 10 years. It looks like a single large gate valve and these are just so you know were the same people who basically built a carbon fiber shell and i kid you not called it vibranium we developed a new material we called it vibranium it takes more than just one person one company it literally takes a movement and that's what we're doing we started to manufacture the first full-scale passenger hyperloop capsule in the world <laughs> now they have an oversized carbon fiber composite coke can that evidently can't hold an atmosphere yet. You put people in this and put it in a vacuum chamber, it'll just leak all the air out in seconds. I mean, just look at it. It's got no engines, no interior, no seats, and maybe most importantly, no life support package. So the interior of the capsule isn't finished yet. They didn't let any cameras inside. Currently, it's a black tunnel. It's waiting to be designed in the next step. And that was two years ago. So you know they must have made lots of progress since then, especially since when they revealed this, they were very clear that within a few years, this would be operational. And if 10 years, everyone would be using them. But it's definitely much sooner than anybody would expect. So, you know, three years and until worldwide adoption, maybe five to 10. Cool. So what does the best part of three years look like? Have they built their Hyperloop yet? Not quite. They've managed to build a single large gate valve, yeah, which you use for one airlock, maybe, such that you get something in one end of the tube, or they could isolate part of the tube. And for some reason, the Hyperloop TT people seem to be really impressed that this valve can actually hold a vacuum. And one of the really amazing things is, is the amount of force that this valve can withstand. Okay, back of an envelope time. Let's call people two meters tall to make it easier. So the height of this tube is about four meters. I really can't be bothered to do the whole circle calculation thing. So let's just call it four meters by four meters. So it's got a cross section here of about 16 square meters. Atmospheric pressure is about 10 tons per square meter. So about 160 tons of force is what you would have on this valve if it's vacuum on one side, which exerts no pressure, and atmospheric pressure on the other. There are 288,000 pounds of force that are applied to the gate of this valve. That's about 72 automobiles or one diesel locomotive. Let's see, 280,000 pounds of force. A kilo is roughly two pounds, so about 140,000 kilos of force which is about 140 tons. Yeah, you're super impressed that your vacuum valve can handle a vacuum? Now, curiously, for a four meter diameter tube, the surface area of one meter length of that tube is equal to the cross section here. So for every meter of this tube, there will be a force of that's about 72 automobiles or one diesel locomotive. And seeing as the tube that everyone keeps promising is going to go from LA to San Francisco, it's about 500 kilometers, half a million meters, it's going to have to take the weight of half a million diesel locomotives. Yes, welcome to the world of Hyperloop TT, which according to the Wall Street Journal, just a month or two ago, is one of the world leaders in Hyperloop technology. It's, it's, it's cost me a Concorde, a railgun, 
and an air hockey table. We'll be able to be faster than the world's fastest bullet train. I have a name for it, name for it, which is called the Hyperloop. Ah, Elon Musk. Of course, Elon Musk. The guy who famously pitched the uh, idea that was so easy was an, an air hockey table. It really wasn't that hard. Pretty complicated, Elon. It's like a tube with an air hockey table. It's really, I swear, it's not that hard. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it wasn't that hard. I'm sure with two years later, it's it's already done. It's so simple. Which one do you prefer? Still the air ratings or do you go with Magna? Uh, okay, that's a, that's a good question. So, you know, the... <clears throat> a couple of minutes later. Um, so, I'd probably advocate um, wheels and... Uh, and <laughs> <laughs> Let's see how the Wall Street Journal reports this idea of her an air hockey table, shall we? In 2013, Elon Musk sketched out an idea to use magnetically levitating capsules inside near vacuum chambers. Oh, sorry, I was momentarily distracted there by how, whilst you were talking about electromagnetic levitation, the picture clearly says air cushion. An idea that was so dumb that it was dropped almost immediately by everyone, including Elon Musk. Um, wheels. And to create a new, super fast mode of transport that could connect LA to San Francisco in around half an hour. Ah, yes, of course. Elon Musk, the man whose prediction should always be taken seriously, like when he predicted that he was going to invent wormholes. I mean, you can think of these like wormholes. In, in like, oh, I need to get to the other side of LA or New York or whatever. Drop down the wormhole, phew, pop out the other side. And then delivered cars driving really slowly through tunnels. Ah, and he was going to revolutionize tunnel digging, of course, making it hundreds of times cheaper and hundreds of times faster using SpaceX technology. So what's the problem with tunnels? They're, they usually take a very long time to build and they're very expensive. Well, that's certainly true. I mean, let's take a 20-year-old a project of digging the channel tunnel. Well, the entire project took about six years to complete and was a 50 kilometer long, it's about 30 mile long tunnel, which means they were doing about eh, five miles per year, that sort of thing. Now, I'm sure with Elon Musk's amazing new SpaceX tunneling machine, which can dig a mile per week. So typically a, a, a tunnel will take three to six months per mile. Um, in some cases, it'll take a year per mile. Okay, so when I, when I say like, yeah, we're gonna have like this tunneling machine that can do a mile a week. Amazing. So his Las Vegas Convention Center loop was less than a mile long. So he must have completed that in less than a week. Right? Construction on this loop was completed in two years for a... Just let that sink in for a second. The old antiquated methods of digging one of the most difficult tunnels in history completed the project at the rate of about uh, a mile in two and a half months. Elon Musk's SpaceX futuristic fast tunneling machine completed a mile in about 24 months, 10 times slower than 20-year-old technology. Cool. So at that rate, he would uh, complete his Vegas loop system in 30-ish um, years? And even at that, it would carry about a tenth of the number of people than if they just ran, say, for instance, regular metro trains in it. And to the Elon Musk fans out there, please try to understand that having a grip on reality is not hating on Elon Musk. It's having a grip on reality. And this sort of video is really important. If only to balance the lack of objectivity of the mainstream media fawning over Elon Musk's latest attention grab. I mean, let's take a point in question. The second I saw Elon Musk's tunnels video, I knew this was so outrageously dumb, it was dead on arrival. There wasn't really even a point doing a busted video about it because it was so obviously stupid that no one could take it. Uh, so his plan is um, simple. He is going to start digging uh, holes in the ground uh, and uh, turn those holes into a vast uh, network of underground tunnels that will change uh, transportation forever. Let's talk about technology. All right. Because I yes. know all of y'all are fans of it. We have some big news in the tech world and innovation icon, Elon Musk. More, yeah, more proof that Elon Musk dreams 
are supersonic. Sharon can hardly wait to ride this. <laughs> Elon can't. Musk is making really headway can't. on his futuristic traffic tunnel. Here's Steph at the social desk yeah. with more. It's Steph. pretty cool, and it's so hard to believe this project is almost finished, right? Yes. Also getting a look at the high-tech tunnel under Los Angeles. Some say wouldn't happen. Musk shared this video of his underground tunnel in Los Angeles, evidence that a stretch of his ambitious high-speed railway project is nearly complete. The three miles of track able to move cars and people at speeds of up to 800 miles per hour. It's amazing. 800 miles an hour. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this this could change transportation forever. And yeah. you could soon hitch a ride mm -hmm. in Elon Musk's first traffic tunnel. He unveiled <laughs> this video showing it's platforms. Incredible. Yeah, it is awesome. It is. They act like elevators and they carry pods to an underground series of tunnels. Those pods could carry eight to 16 passengers or a single passenger vehicle wow. at speeds of more than 120 miles per hour. And the pedestrians and cyclists, well, they would get first priority. That is great. Right? Well, it looks pretty cool. And who wouldn't want to blast past the L.A. traffic oh. at 150 miles an hour? I got my hand up. Mm -hmm, me too. But tonight we're asking, is L.A. really ready for that Elon Musk tunnel vision? <laughs> yeah, Musk has posted a sneak peek last night of that short transportation tunnel that he has dug under the streets of Hawthorne. And all day long, people in L.A. have been talking about it. It's sort of like, it's almost like an autonomous underground multi-level car system. That cost a dollar. That cost a dollar, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, you can think of these like wormholes. In, in like, oh, I need to get to the other side of L.A. or New York or whatever. Drop down the wormhole, phew, pop out the other side. At about 30 miles per hour. So it's just a slower, less efficient, less accessible subway with gamer lights. Or it's a comically undersized tunnel with no safety features and added disco lights, sure to induce claustrophobia and disorientation. And wow, Elon Musk made a tunnel that's a safety hazard with galaxy lights. What a visionary. Yeah, I, I am constantly amazed by Elon Musk's ability to promise people that they can all trade in their smartphones now, their obsolete technology. He's going to revolutionize phone design. And then two years later, he gives them this. And even at that, they're still like... You know, like Elon Musk has just invented sliced bread or something. Yeah, you're going to have to bear in mind that for years I have been a voice in the wilderness calling out this crap for what it is. And for those years had to suffer the mindless, vapid taunting of Elon Musk fans telling me how I was just jealous of Elon Musk's wealth and genius and how revolutionary the loop was going to be. Yeah, I think it's pertinent that we don't let them forget who was chucking the techno messiah snake oil for the last few years. Anyway, sorry, I didn't mean to go off on Musk. Where were we? Oh yeah, that's right. The Wall Street Journal's article about the Hyperloop. It's, it's, it's crossed between a Concorde, a rail gun, and an air hockey table. We'll be able to be faster than the world's fastest bullet train. I have a name for it, name for it, which is called the Hyperloop. Yeah, right. Fast forward to 2021, and two companies, Virgin Hyperloop and Hyperloop TT, are in a neck and neck race to turn the idea into a reality and develop the world's first commercial Hyperloop system. Uh, not really. You see, for this to be a race, someone would have to have a serious chance of finishing. It's like saying there's a, a race to build the first mobile phone powered by a personalized nuclear reactor. I mean, sure, you can call it a race if you want to spice up your reporting, but that doesn't really change the fact that this isn't on the cards anytime soon. I mean, realistically, having seen firsthand the uh, Virgin Hyperloop track, as far as, it's quite funny, actually. So this is just the access road. Focus. Is that the access road just for the power line? And that is the entire Hyperloop. Well, of Hyperloop 1 anyway. This here is an access road for uh, a power line. And it's absolutely in the middle of nowhere. You know, so the nearest you've got, or the nearest interesting stuff, is you've got some solar power stations here, the main road. And then it's... Uh, outside Las Vegas. 
But why why would you put uh, this? What makes this the perfect site in the absolute middle of nowhere? And perhaps most importantly, finding the ideal location to install the revolutionary transit system. They're probably at something like the 1% mark. You know, they've not even started to look at how they're going to get this thing straight enough uh, to go at these very high speeds or what they're going to do with bad expansion joints or how on earth they're going to keep a vacuum that high. You know, let alone worry about the land acquisition rights for building something like this. But to be fair to Virgin Hyperloop, Hyperloop TT by comparison are an absolute joke. They are 10% of what Virgin Hyperloop has. Our dream of uh, creating the next breakthrough in transportation takes a big step forward today. We're building the first full-scale passenger Hyperloop capsule in the world. Yeah, that was four years ago. Then not a lot happens for about two years. Then this happens. We started to manufacture the first full-scale passenger Hyperloop capsule in the world. By using cutting-edge technology, we're transforming mobility as we know it. Hyperloop TT engineers have designed next generation safe travel with world class partners. So the interior of the capsule isn't finished yet. They didn't let any cameras inside. Together, we have built the world's first Hyperloop passenger capsule. And now we're sending it to our research and development facility in Toulouse for integration and testing. Then not a lot happens for another two years. And now they have revealed that they have a single vacuum valve. Wow, this is real progress. Now, this is going to happen really soon. We're talking years, not decades. Both companies have signed agreements to potentially carry paying passengers and goods by the end of the decade in the US and other countries. It's definitely much sooner than anybody would expect. So, you know, three years and until worldwide adoption, maybe five to ten. This is sheer delusion. Virgin Hyperloop will be the first I think that we are leading the race. They've both raised tens of millions of dollars from high-profile investors. Oh, what was that? Hyperloop TT claims that it has 800 people working on this. Hyperloop TT was founded in California in 2013 and says it has some $130 million in funding. Today, we've got more than 800 contributors in 50 companies that are working together to develop it. Not quite. Let's investigate that claim. Just just a little bit, shall we? Cool. So here we are on the Hyperloop TT's website, where we're going to take a look at what our potential for a career in this empty warehouse containing a carbon fiber shell on two metal girders is going to look like. Purposeful visionary. The world has too many passengers and too few at the wheel to take us where we want to go, blah, blah, blah. Global collective of innovators and creatives are busy turning a high-speed pipe dream into a reality. Different nationalities, skill sets, and backgrounds. We spend our nights thinking about the future and our days building it. Okay. So let's see what sort of thing that we have to do here. We work tirelessly, blah, blah, blah. No hurdles, zero carbon emissions. Huh, that's odd. You can join the world's greatest journey simply by working remotely 10 plus hours a week in exchange for what? Money? Uh, for a salary? No, for stock options. Uh-huh. So you expect people to work for you for free on the basis that at some point in the future, your company might be worth something. Yeah. Okay. So what do we got? Departments. So where we got business development, compliance, design, engineering. Okay. Let's, let's take a look at engineering, shall we? And... Okay, they've got three for engineering, an internship, an internship, and an internship. Seriously? Three internships, that's it. Okay, we're not doing that. Let's take a look at design. Let's be part of designing the future of, of transport. And let's go for design project manager. That sounds important. Let's be one of those, shall we? Where Hyperloop TT created the world's first 
crowd collaboration model connecting experts from around the world to build the first commercial Hyperloop system. This is a remote position with 10 plus hours a week in exchange for stock options. You are so busted. So you expect someone with a bachelor degree, three years experience, blah, blah, blah. Okay, let's try something a little more innovative. Let's go for marketing, shall we? Where I want to promote these people. So let's see if we can find somewhere. Social media specialist. Marketing project manager. That sounds like me. Let's see what I would have to do to market these people um, oh, right. This is a remote position with 10 plus hours a week in exchange for stock options. Today, we've got more than 800 contributors in 50 companies that are working together to develop. If we can find something actually decent here. Safety and regulation. That sounds good. This really, I mean, for this, you are uh, what? There are there are no positions. There is only a, a general application position for safety and regulation, where you will be working 10 plus hours a week in exchange for stock options. And if you can't quite smell the vaporware coming off Hyperloop TT yet, you come to the About Us section with the Bringing Visionaries Together, founded in 2013. In the best part of 10 years ago, Hyperloop TT has established a network of more than 800 highly skilled individuals across uh, five continents all working for um, stock options. We've created powerful partnerships with universities and corporations, passion driven, blah, blah, blah. And there it is. That's, that's their entire, that's their entire dream there. Um, okay. And they have some people who actually presumably get paid off all of this. Not 800 of them, notably. Um, lots of management types there. But then you come down to the offices. And this is where it all really does start to ring the alarm bells. Look, they've got offices in Los Angeles, San Paolo, Barcelona, Toulouse, and France. Well, let's go take a look at... Oh, that's bizarre. They've, they've, they've forgotten the link to their LA offices and to their San Paolo offices and to their Barcelona offices and to their Toulouse offices and to their Dubai offices. Ha! Huh. Okay. Well, let's do a search for them on Google Maps, and we come up with three locations. Yeah, oddly enough, Google seems to struggle to confirm the existence of their Barcelona and Brazil offices. But we got one in America, one in Toulouse, and one in Dubai. So let's take a look at the one in America first. And there it is. That's it there, in the middle of LA. In... Oh, easy to lose. There he is. That's that's him there. That's that's the um, Hyperloop TT. So let's take a look at their LA offices. Looks kind of like a, a, a shed, but I'm I'm sure it'll be much more impressive. That oh, it is just a shed. Okay. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's your Hyperloop TT in Los Angeles. Okay, let's take a look at them in Toulouse. So this is where they are in Toulouse. And have I lost them again already? No. They're at the end of the runway somewhere. They're at the end of this, <laughs> this runway here somewhere. About, there they are. There they are, got them. That's their Toulouse offices. And it turns out that this here is their entire Hyperloop system. It's not quite actually been built on this yet, but that's that's the system that they think is going to be connecting things hundreds of miles apart in a few years. Anyway, so that's the Toulouse office. Let's take a look at their Dubai office, shall we? So their Dubai office is indeed in Dubai. And it's in this thing here, which is curiously got playground cluster four. Playground Cluster 3, Playground Cluster 2. It's almost like it's a residential area. And Hyperloop Transportation is there, right? In, it looks like it's actually in a residential building. Odd that. Good. So let's keep this all in perspective. Uh, how close these things are to completion by looking 
at the actual Hyperloop systems that have actually been built. So this is Las Vegas out in the Nevada desert. And yeah, just to give you a ballpark feel of what's the minimum size of Hyperloop that you would need to get up to, the minimum amount of Hyperloop you would need to get up to this, you know, 500 miles per hour sort of Ferrari type accelerations and decelerations is about that long. And you can immediately see what the problem is. You have to go very straight because you're going very fast, which means that terrain can be a bit of a problem here. Now, the world's uh, most technically competent Hyperloop is Virgin Hyperloop 1. And that is the entire system out in the Nevada desert. And just so we're clear on the size, it's uh, just over half a kilometer long, I think. Let me just check that. The size is yeah, it's 0.5 kilometers, which is actually quite long compared to to the Hyperloop TT version, which is about that size. I mean, it's, you know, we, we're talking the sort of thing that it'll take you uh, less than a minute to drive at 30 miles per hour. So, uh, sorry, I stand corrected. You could run from one end of this tube to the other in less than a minute. But even at this, you can see the gate valve on the Virgin Hyperloop system and the airlock at the end. And <laughs> you can also see that there isn't one at the other end. Virgin has more money, about $400 million. Their CEO, Jay Walder, says, Which means that the only way to get in and out of the Virgin Hyperloop system is at one end. Not only is their test track longer, but it's also carried its first passengers. And they are one-tenth of the actual size that you would need to actually get up to any sort of sensible speed. Fast forward to 2021 and two companies, Virgin Hyperloop and Hyperloop TT, are in a neck and neck race to turn the idea into a reality and develop the world's first commercial Hyperloop system. Anyway, let's go to the French version of this and actually take a look at it in situ in Toulouse, France. And this is the Hyperloop TT's headquarters there. And on this sort of scrap piece of land next to the airport is where they built their test track. But anyway, I can measure it. And when I measure it, I find out that it is a whopping 300 meters long. And their capsule, if I remember rightly, is it's about one tenth this length, which means that even if, even if they could get their carbon fiber uh, empty shell to move up and down this tube, it's farcical. It's going like 10 times its own body length in this tube. Andres De Leon is Hyperloop TT's CEO. He says the company has created this full-scale carriage and a test track in Europe. I think it's a race to be able to get this done right now, and, and we really love the race. Some analysts say Virgin has the edge, mostly because of its patents and resources. Yeah, but this is like saying that you have the edge in putting nuclear power plants into phones. The next big goal for both Virgin and Hyperloop TT is to build six mile long test tracks by 2025. Now, not only is that pathetically short in that that length wouldn't even be able to accelerate you up to about half the advertised speed of the Hyperloop. Let's just break down the build times there for a second. What did they say? It's about six miles of test track in about six years ish. So about a mile per year. So hang on, let me think, a mile per year, and we want one between LA and San Francisco, about 600 miles apart. Now let's think, how long is that gonna take us to build? So on that happy note, thanks for watching. And if you really enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up. And if you don't wanna miss out on more videos like this, consider subscribing. And as ever, if you really enjoyed the work of this channel, you can support it directly through Patreon and uh, thanks for watching.